Today on the Pro Life Podcast, recently, organ donations in pop culture. What have they gotten right? What have they gotten wrong? We need to talk about this. Let's get started. Happy Thursday, Pro Life family. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Yes, for Thanksgiving. Yeah. Oh, we're going to talk about John Oliver, which kind of weirds me out that John Oliver is the topic today. But hey. <laughs> He makes himself relevant sometimes. Yes. But first, my friends at the table. Kim Schwartz, Director of Media and Communication. Dr. John Sego, President of Texas Right to Life. Brett Clarenman, IT Director. Um, John, good to have you back again. We yes. never get you yeah. two episodes in a row. Whoa. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is fun. You know? man. Holidays, man. Bring if them, this was the only the part together. of my job, just coming <laughs> and making fun of liberal oh my gosh. Yeah, people. Like, yeah, yeah. Do it. People who said dumb things on the internet. Yeah. I think my hope in humanity would just absolutely crater. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, um, John Oliver recently had a bit about organ donation. Yes. Um, and because this is recent and this is a pro-life issue that often gets forgotten about. Mm-hmm. Um, this isn't a new issue. It's been an issue for a while since organ donation was kind of became a thing. Yep. Um, since people realized they could make money off of dead bodies. <laughs> hmm. um, and there's a couple of things you said that I think I kind of agree with. Very, very small things. Right, and right. then there's some other stuff that you said that is yeah, absolutely not right. So can you tell us first, because you actually saw this episode, right? You watched John. I did. Oh, yeah. man. I don't know if you want to say that. About this. No, I can internet. admit that. I can admit that. So, yeah. So, I mean, John Oliver, he's a comedian. He, uh, you know, notoriously is the voice of Zazu on the live action uh, Lion King. See, the worst one. That's worst not one. a flex, I'm just, though. I'm, this is, I'm just giving you information. Okay, Value fair. it as you want, good <laughs> or bad. Um, oh, wait. If I, this I, were I have the very animated strong, one. I have very strong Netflix. feelings about the animated Lion King. So, of yeah. course. Yeah. Live action is just there. The but okay. Action. He was Anyway, John that's on his there. resume. <laughs> that's a point of fact. Okay. Okay. Um, he also has a show la- called Last Week Tonight where he reviews, you know, headlines. And then he's, he's kind of like tries to do a deep dive on one policy issue each right. episode. And so, you know, 15, 20 minute you know, discussion of one specific issue. And a lot of times this gets into our space, right? So before the Ohio election, um, a couple of months ago, he, you know, talked about abortion and how that was right. playing into elections and how that was playing out since stop. So he's, you know, pro-lifers pay attention to his rants because he is reflecting on and, uh, you know, discussing things that we care about. Uh, this most recent episode, he talked about organ donation, which okay. as a bioethicist, yeah. You know, as somebody who's published on this topic and continuing to watch this debate, I was like, you know, very, very interested in in his debate and or his discussion of it. And, you know, it kind of brought up one thing of like pro-lifers. It, it kind of reiterates pro-lifers need to be paying attention to this space, uh, this issue, um, but also kind of like we need to know what the kind of secular kind of discussion is about and how it's kind of missing some of the most important topics. So that's kind of why it got onto my radar. Um, And, uh, you know, I think it will be a good lens for us to have a a good conversation about organ donation and pro-lifers concern about it generally. Yeah. And so the story that prompted John Oliver to actually talk about organ donation, like I imagine he doesn't always talk about that on his show, um, was there was a uh, organ procurement agency, somebody who takes the organ from one patient to bring it somewhere else. And that agency left the organ on a Southwest flight and Southwest had to turn around and bring it back to where it was because, you know, you just forget your organs on your plane sometimes. Mm -hmm. So his statement on, you know, we have to do better in this. There seems right. like a very obvious place yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. to do better. Let's not misplace the really valuable, irreplaceable mm-hmm, mm-hmm. organ that is being transferred to save somebody's life. Because, yep. I mean, that's that's why we do this yeah. when we do this. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Okay. So obvious critique there. John Oliver actually, like, a- analyzes that right of, like, maybe we shouldn't leave organs on planes. Um, yeah. And there yep. was a quote from one of the industry professionals that he talked about from one of the organ procurement organizations that was like, if I order a toothbrush 
it's tracked. I can tell you it every, <laughs> yes, in the next 48 yes. hours, exactly where that toothbrush I ordered from Amazon is. Like mm -hmm. it's in that warehouse, it's mm -hmm. on that truck, it's yeah. down the street, it's now on my porch. And he was like, but with, and he was a doctor, sorry, he was a doctor saying, but when I put in the you know order for this organ donation that it is gonna be delivered to my hospital, he was like, I don't know where it is. And it could be on a plane, you know, Southwest yeah. plane. So like that point was his like, we, there is brokenness in the system that, you know, the, it has not upgraded in technology. It doesn't have, you know, GPS tracking for the organs, yeah. things like, like that. So yeah. that was most of the, the thrust of the argument is our organ donation system needs to be more efficient. I mean, if I can order a toothbrush and know where it is. Yeah, yeah. that was their argument. As opposed to a many thousands of dollar organ. Right. Yeah, yeah I feel like somebody missed a yeah. goal here. Yeah. So that's kind of the idea. It, like the main point was we need to be more efficient. Um, there are all of these. And this is a tr classic problem with organ donation system in the United States is every year the gap between individuals waiting for an organ and you know actual organ donations, that gap is getting bigger. Mm -hmm. So even though we are increasing the number of donors and donations, the number of Americans who need the donations mm -hmm. is getting more at a, at a bigger mm. you know, pace. And so when we look at that, and this is what I've written about in the bioethics space, is mm -hmm. like the solutions that have been made to close that gap are not sufficient in and of themselves to close the gap, but also a lot of the ideas that are coming out are unethical um, of to how do we, we close that gap. So that's kind of like my concern. And then he starts talking about this and he makes it sound like the only problem is efficiency and modernization so that we're better at getting organ don uh, donations. And, and for us as pro-lifers, it's kind of like you're missing the fundamental the kind of the foundational questions about organ donation and some of the ways that we approach this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and having been to worked our conventions for a long time and heard a lot of doctors, this is an issue we've talked about at Convention for Life, Boots on the Ground for many years and have heard that. And that's really when the, the real bioethics issues here kind of came up in my radar. Cause I'm like, well, yeah, it's a problem. It's complicated. But then hearing these conversations with these doctors, like, oh yeah like the idea of what's dead enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's where it gets really messy. Yeah. So the beginning of this, you know, our concern as pro-lifers is we care for the most vulnerable. Um, right. The lives that are neglected, the lives that are, you know, not, the society is, is ready to discard. And so that becomes obviously, you know, in the early church, it was infants, that mm -hmm. unwanted infants were left, you know, to, to be exposed to the elements and they would pass away on the doorsteps or they would pass away, you know, outside of the home. And that's when Christians would go and like rescue those kids. And so the Christian ethic, the pro-life ethic of saving the most vulnerable, those on the most, you know, the margins of society, that has now in today's, you know, kind of context translated to vulnerable patients. Mm -hmm. And so one of, you know, obviously, you know, unborn children, their mothers, you know, we, we care for these because they are lives that are neglected, that are ignored. Um, that need assistance, need value, where our societies kind of turn their back on them. That also applies to vulnerable patients. And so patients that otherwise society would say, well, they're not making money, they're not you know, helping the economy, they're actually a burden to their family or you know, to the community, um, they don't really have a great quality of life, they don't have anything to contribute, so these lives are less valuable, not as worth you know, as much as our time. The interesting thing about organ donation uh, is that it looked at these this population and it said, actually, they have something valuable in their organs. And so they're not contributing in these other ways. Their life is not contributing, but maybe their death could contribute to society by us you know, using their organs for other individuals that are sick and dying, but have the potential to rejoin society, rejoin our economic you know, system and contribute something. And so... That's kind of where, first off, pro-lifers should be really concerned of you're looking at someone and seeing a material kind of right. objective um, or, you know, them as an object. Oh, their value is in something other than them as an individual created in the image of God. Um, yeah. And so 
that should be like, just from a conceptual standpoint, that should be our red flag. When, is. Yeah, when you start talking about people like project cars, like I'm going to need this donor <laughs> car so I can have the parts to get this mm -hmm. other car up and going and, and at its best again. Yeah. At, these are people, right? Mm -hmm. Not parts. Yeah. And, and I think it's tough because as pro-lifers, when we think about ourselves, when we think about, well, if I was dying, I would want, you know, to do the most good. And so even some of the slogans that have caught on around organ donation is like donate life. Mm -hmm. Like that is actually the, the predominant slogan yeah. used by these organ procurement organizations. And so as pro-lifers, we're like, heck yeah, like that's what we want to do. Self, it's a self giving act. It could help others. It's you know self-denying. Like this sounds great. Like this sounds like a really virtuous activity, um, which is great from a personal standpoint. But whenever we as a society look and say, hey, I've got an idea for you. I, I've got an, a, virtue, a virtue you could practice right. that benefits us. Uh, that's kind of where it's like, okay, now it's gone from a virtue to like a transaction. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that conceptually, that's one thing we have to be conscious, conscious of is just as we don't want to commodify children and make them, you know, part of our economic system that we could pay for and, and receive, like, we have to be careful with organ donation yeah. in that same capacity. Um, so that's just kind of like on the conceptual level, we should be concerned. Um, but then we look in practice, we do have this big issue of who qualifies to be organ donors medically. Mm. And that's was, I mean, you know, Kim, you talk to our team about this all the time. I think you guys just sent out a campaign about we deal with vulnerable patients who hospitals are very ready to say, okay, you know, your, your life is, you know, your life is no more value, but you can become a donor. Um, and that's kind of where the other big issue for pro-lifers comes in is how do, how do our doctors, how does our medical system get to the point where it says you now are only, we only recognize you as an organ donor, um, no longer as a patient to be cared for. Yeah. I'm trying to wrap my brain around that idea. Like how, how do you look a family in the face and say, well, but their their quality of life, so they're 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 better as parts than as a person now. Yeah, yeah. So so brain death uh, is kind of you know the biggest tool that we see week in you know week out of hospitals saying to a family, hey, you know the patient is brain dead, and so they could you know they're not going to have quality of life. We don't think they're going to recover. We don't think they're you know going to have a life worth living. However, there is a redeemable, you know, option here for that patient. Man, that's a mess. And the idea that, you know, whenever families are faced with these situations too, it's not on their best day. Nobody uh, is no. having the greatest day of their life in the hospital there uh, when their patient, uh, their family member is, you know, not doing well and very well could die very soon. Um, and so then these organ procurement agents, uh, organizations come in and they're like, mm. hey, you know what we should do? Well, I, I understand from the donation standpoint that you have a limited amount of time. Mm -hmm. Like we, we need these, <laughs> for lack of a better term, they need to be as fresh as you can get, right? Um, but hovering like a pack of mm -hmm. buzzards mm -hmm. over somebody's loved one. Yeah. And then pressuring them into, well, this is this is the best thing to do. Yeah. With the high risk, too, that we don't even know. Like, if they're talking about brain death, we don't even know what they mean by that. We don't mm. know because uh, right. the criteria for brain death varies by hospital to hospital. So you don't know how dead is this person. Um, the Guardian, uh, you know, not a bastion of conservative <laughs> viewpoints, but the, no, the news but... outlet, The Guardian, just put out a huge article about this debate over brain death. And the problem is that you have all of these scientists coming out saying, you know, we're jumping to conclusions about these patients and then, or, you know, authorizing, withdrawing them from life-sustaining treatment, then becoming organ donors. And we're making that conclusion too, you know, prematurely. Mm -hmm. We're too soon. We're, we're jumping there. Whereas all the science says, especially with brain injured patients, um, more and more evidence is coming out that we're getting mm -hmm. it wrong is that we have too severe of diagnosis before, you know, really giving these patients, especially young patients, um, you know, before the age of 25, um, giving them a, a fair chance to recover 
but yet we have built in this system of organ donation where the organ procurement company or organizations come in and you know convince the family, hey, the best course of action at this point is not wait, give your your loved one time to recover, but the most redeemable thing you can do is to authorize them from organ donation. So, you know, that being said, we're not anti-organ donation. It's a, it's a right. great thing. I've got you know a, a really good friend of mine um, donated a, a kidney to his aunt, and it was extremely you know redeemable story. It was an amazing um, witness of of loving you know how how we love one another. Um, not anti organ donation. We just have to balance that with being pro life, with being you know sub, kind of yes. protecting the most vulnerable patient in the equation, which is usually the brain injured patient. Yeah, yeah. I uh, we need to take a quick break, but I do want to cover like this I, the fuzziness on brain death. Just so everybody's on the same page, because this this is the thing that hospitals like to say. This is why we say, you know, the best course is yeah. brain death. So. Uh, We want to talk about that a little bit in just a minute. Great news. Texas Right to Life is celebrating our 50th birthday this year. This is half a century of victories that the Lord has given us, but God is not done yet. The battle for life is only increasing as the abortion industry is going underground to promote death and cell abortion. Join us in supporting Texas Right to Life's 50th birthday campaign and chip in with a gift today. Thank you for 50 years of saving lives. And friend, the best is yet to come. Without warning, you or your loved one could end up in the emergency room where every second counts and your medical wishes matter more than ever. However, if your loved one doesn't have the right medical documents on hand, they may not be able to make decisions for you in a crisis. My Life Angels solves all of this by walking you through step-by-step in creating these important medical documents and storing them online securely for you and your family to access at any time. The service is only $7 a month, but use the link in our description for 20% off your initial subscription period. Don't let strangers make life and death decisions for you. Get the My Life Angels app today. Welcome back, friends. So continuing the discussion on organ donation, and we've we've tossed the term brain death a couple of times out here. And I, I, I want to clear up, there seems to be that dead, right? It's death. But why did you just say we didn't give people enough time to recover from brain death? <laughs> yeah. That... Hold on. Right. You usually don't <laughs> but, recover. Yeah. From, I, I, I mostly heard, dead all day. I, yeah. I like, have heard about a guy who, who did recover from death, but uh, that, yeah, but that's not the norm. So, this is a friend of ours, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it is not normal, common. Yeah. So I, I just want to clear up brain death and death. One doesn't necessarily equal the other. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we use the term brain death just because that's what is in the conversation. But yeah, it is It is not death in, in how we usually use the term. Um, so a brain dead patient, their heart is still beating, they're still breathing, they still have, um, you know, they, that, they could still go through puberty, they could still um, have, uh, you know, their unborn child be developing and, and actually, um, you know, to, to full term. Uh, so because a patient is declared brain dead does not necessarily mean they are no heart, they're turning cold, they're, you know, decomposing it doesn't sound very dead yeah yeah, yeah. so, <laughs> so you said that's, it like we that, prefer like, that's and this dead. is kind of i mean we prefer brain injured you know mm-hmm. it's like until we have you know confirmed what what is their condition they are you know a patient with a severe brain injury and that's how we should treat them um and and this is really the difficulty and this is what's interesting about the conversation and you know our audience may start noticing some of this debate and even in you know secular non-pro-life <laughs> context is there's a debate about how accurate is our notion of brain death in general. Mm-hmm. Um, there have been presidential commissions about this. Um, there have been, uh, there's been conversations uh, about it, you know, kind of in some of the, uh, some of the political kind of circles with candidates. So, I mean, it's, it's a really important issue, but it, it kind of hits home at every neighborhood. I mean, every hospital has a brain death protocol where if a patient has a certain uh, kind of brain injury that they run different types of tests, a couple of tests, and then they come to this conclusion that they tell the family, either we think your loved one is brain dead, we have tested that they're brain dead, or they will be brain dead soon. And so this kind of vague 
throwing out this term for families to think, oh, I need to give up hope. And now I need to turn to how do I redeem the situation just with brain death. Feels more like a marketing term than a technical scientific definition. It is. And I mean, the analogy, and I've used it a lot here, but the analogy is like legal blindness. You know, so if you're legally blind, um, you're not uh, you're not biologically blind. You can still see. But as a society, we said you're blind enough that you're not safe on the road. Like right. if you're you're legally blind, you have to have glasses to drive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now it's not biological blindness. You're not absolutely blind. But as a society, we're kind of creating this term legally blind to protect everybody. Well, that's what we did with brain death is you're not biologically dead. There's still activity going on. Your body's still functioning in an area. There's still a heartbeat. There's still all these other biological elements. Um, however, for society's sake, we've drawn this line and said, we're going to assume you're blind for the benefit of others, you know, that we don't waste resources on you, that we can use you, you know, use your uh, organs for other patients, um, and that, you know, you're not taking up a bed whenever we have somebody else that, that may need that ICU bed. So we've kind of created this artificial line, and that's not coming from me. That's coming from a secular um, right. trog, a secular bioethicist who, um, you know, tracks these things, and he's not pro-life by any stretch of the imagination, but he kind of makes that analogy of, yes, this is artificial, but he defends it. He says, but it, we need to. And I think that's what a lot of people think is, yeah, you throw out the term death. It's usually not subjective. Um, okay. Well, yeah. thank you. <laughs> it's when, when you say we, we're not giving, especially younger patients, time to recover from brain death, <laughs> it sounds kind of ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, it so. is a little. Goodness. Well, with all of that, um, with the organ donation problems, with the brain death problems, what are things that pro-lifers should look out for, um, for things that we can do to give our, to protect our loved ones or protect ourselves? Yeah. So at Texas Right to Life, we have a whole team dedicated mm -hmm. to uh, walking with families who are going through this at the hospital. So, you know, families who their loved one is, is hospitalized and, you know, they're, they OPOs or their physicians or their medical team is putting pressure on them. Um, they call us and are, you know, great. We have great patient advocates, you know, Miranda and Ashley are, are saints. I mean, they're amazing. They walk with families. They give them practical advice of how to help in these situations. Um, and so the most important thing you can do, though, is ask questions, really, is, is just ask questions. You know, what tests were done? Are there more tests we can do? Yep. Are there second opinions we can get to make sure we're actually certain? And, you know, tragically, there are times when our loved ones are not going to recover. You know, our loved ones are hospitalized. And unfortunately, you know, this is the time the Lord has ordained for them to pass away. Um, and, and that's just something we have to cope with. Right. But before we get there, we have to make sure that we're not neglecting them, that we're not, you know, kind of turning our back on them. And so a lot of it is just asking questions, especially whenever terms like brain death, or coma are thrown out. Okay, you know, um, what tests did we do? Are there other tests? You know, can we bring a second opinion in? Um, you know, what is the likelihood of recovery? Um, you know, can we do a time uh, trial? You know, these types of, of questions, just kind of inquiring. And, mm -hmm. and what we've seen with our families is when you start asking those questions, you kind of get through where we've had doctors say, oh, well, they're mostly brain dead. And it's like, wait, what? I thought this That's, was like a either or. <laughs> this is and, not the Princess Bride. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Or they'll say, uh, well, you know, they will be brain dead. And it's like, okay, well, I will die one day also. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, Wait so a minute. I'm not going, so not, are you, I'm doctor. Not going to go ahead and like give up on this. So, so just, you know, asking questions, calling, you know, you know, calling Texas Right to Life's patient advocacy team. We yeah. would love to, to help advise on that. Um, and then also, you know, one of the things that we talk about a lot is medical power of attorneys, you know, making sure that you've identified who do you want making decisions in that. Because what we've experienced is sometimes parents um, have not identified who makes decisions for them. And the, you know, their spouse is not around and you have adult children who disagree, you know, and that's really difficult on the family. It's also ex impossible on your medical professionals because they don't know, you know, they're trying to <laughs> help the family, you know, come to peace and come to unity. Um, so identifying, you know, who do you want making your medical decisions for you and then making sure they know your values. 
Um, so personally, I've decided not to put organ donation on my driver's license because I want that decision to be context sensitive. So I want my wife to be able to be in the ICU and asking the right questions. And then if she sees, okay, this really is the time that the Lord is calling for John to pass away, then, then she can make that decision whether I become an organ donor or not. Now that requires me to trust my wife, right? Yep. That requires me to trust yep. those around me. And these days, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't feel right because I want to like express my autonomy, my independence. No, no, no. <laughs> like being a human, I'm I'm married to this woman. I love her to death. Like I'm like literally to death. I am going to trust her yeah. with yep. this and thing. And I think that's something like it takes some humility. But these are the types of things we have to think through to get where uh, we're making prudent decisions, you know, when it comes to our own care and the care of loved ones. Yeah. And just a real quick comment on that. You're saying you took it off your driver's license. And if if you don't know watching at home, um, having that little thing on your driver's license means a third party makes that decision, yeah. not your loved one. So doesn't mean because you took it off there that you're it's not a possibility your right. wife can't donate your organs. Yeah. It just means somebody other than your wife doesn't get to make that decision. Exactly. Yeah. If I did have that light on my license, practically my wife would not get to make the decision about when we decide life sustaining treatment is going to be stopped uh and an organ donation is going to start. So and this is not, I mean, I'm not, you know. <clears throat> accusing the right. medical field of anything that we haven't seen firsthand. So maybe this is not every hospital. Every hospital, and this is one of the part of the problem, every hospital has their own protocol, their own tests, but we have witnessed hospitals that say, hey spouse, I hear what you're saying. You wanna give them another week on the, or another day or a couple of days on the ventilator. They're an organ donor. They've already made the decision. They don't wanna drag this out. And they've overinterpret what it means when you put the little heart on your on your driver's license. So unfortunately, that's, that's just, just not a okay. safe thing to do right now. Right. Especially if you want you know to empower your loved ones to make that decision. And so we do have um, uh, you know one of our uh, staff members, Catherine Pitcher, did write an article or mm -hmm. do a video. I can't remember. Which it, was it was an article. It is okay. one of the most popular articles on our website, okay. like of all time. There are people coming to this very frequently. Um, about how to why this person um, Catherine took her um, took herself off of the organ donation registry, like took that heart off of her license. But then also that there's another step that you have to uh, remove yourself from the organ donation yeah. registry. So not just telling the DMV, hey, no, I don't want to be a um, organ right. donor. Um, but then there's that other step of making sure that you're off of the organ donation registry. Yeah, yeah. So we can put a link. Like yep. in, the, yep. in the comments to that article, but that's just a practical way. And you're not saying I hate organ donations. I don't want to, <laughs> no. you know, I mean, not the, what we're saying at all. Yeah. I mean, you know, John Paul II called this like, you know, one of the greatest acts of uh, selfless love to, to become an organ donor. And I completely agree with that. Um, the fact is I want to make sure my loved one and myself are actually dead before I make yeah. that selfless act. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to, you know, hasten my own death or the death of my loved ones to get to organ donation. And so that's kind of what was frustrating in a lot of this conversation in bioethics and then with John Oliver is, yes, there is a lot wrong with the organ donation system, but these conversations in the secular kind of context don't even get to the most important questions yeah. about what are we saying about human beings, that they're only important as parts. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's a real concern. And then also, can we, you know, we need to raise the standard to make sure we're not victimizing vulnerable patients who are not dead, uh, but we're kind of writing them off as dead. So those are kind of the most important things that these conversations usually neglect, which us as pro-lifers, we are in the position where we have to keep bringing this up. Thanks. What are some um, pie in the sky ideal um, fixes? Maybe not even pie in the sky. What are some <laughs> ideal fixes um, to the organ donation process that pro-lifers could pray for or look out for? Yeah, so, you know, we have some, uh, thankfully in Texas, we have some state representatives that are really sensitive towards this. Um, they've witnessed some abuses that they want to uh, address. Um, they have been working on that for about 10 years and okay. the political apparatus, you know, the, the organ procurement organizations come up and testify. But some of the things are guaranteeing, um, guaranteeing, you know, 
comprehensive testing for every um, brain injured patient. So guaranteeing that no matter what hospital you land in, it you will get the same amount of tests wherever you are before the announcement that you're brain dead. And is. they testify against this, that? Yes. Oh my God. Yes, this because it's seems... so basic though. So, so that's the one, the guarantee of second opinion. Okay, so maybe this hospital has internally their culture of how they handle things or what, you know, the you know, people who have grown up in this one environment, they do things because their mentor did these things. And, you know, but having a second opinion, somebody who's an expert in the field come out, you know, um, guarantee a second opinion. Some states guarantee that. Texas doesn't. Sad. Um, and then also there's a more controversial topic that some pro-lifers agree with, some don't. But um, in some states, in like New Jersey, there is a religious exemption. And so it says, if you think that brain death criteria violates your religious beliefs, your family can just opt out of that. And, and so that's kind of wow. where we get cases like Jahai McMath, mm -hmm. where her mother said, no, we're Christians. Mm -hmm. um, we believe that as long as there's a, a heartbeat, Mm -hmm. uh, that the soul is still present in her body and I don't want to give up on her. Mm -hmm. And so she transferred her, you know, Jahai, her, her daughter, uh, to another hospital that was respecting that. And so now that's controversial. It kind of is a whole can of worms, right. yeah. but that's the kind of thing that, you know, as we get further into this controversy, things that we have to ha discuss. Yeah. And so I would pray for the boldness of our elected officials to bring up these issues, to push back on political pressure and to make sure that we are, you know, protecting the most vulnerable among us, even when like all the political forces are trying to maintain the status quo. <laughs> all right, let's go. Well, and I would also say technology advancing, we are between artificial organs and 3D printed Oh, organs. there we go, yes. We're headed in a direction where the whole donation thing may not be that big a deal. Yeah. It may not be as necessary as we seem to think it is. No, I mean, that's a brilliant, and we could do a whole episode on that, but like that is the great, ultimately, pie in the sky, that's the pro-life alternative. Right. Is let's get the meat market out of the question, so to speak, sorry, mm -hmm. it's a little aggressive. <laughs> but like, let's get people as donors off, out of the equation. Yeah. And how can we come up with technological, you know, alternatives? Mm -hmm. The problem is, that the money involved in the current system is wanting to maintain the status quo. Mm. And so when you look at the gap between, you know, needed don donations and donors, even our best attempts right. is not going to close that until we turn to, you know, artificial organs, 3D printed organs. And and there have been some great advances there, but all of the market forces are against those developments. Right and into, well, let's just get better OPOs. Let's just get better systems. Let's just do GPS tracking to close this gap. Uh, that That's not gonna ultimately solve all the problems. I feel like a state as big as Texas, as big a technological powerhouse as Texas could make some investments and fill that gap. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Pie in the sky things. Yeah, no, oh, and that's God. a great example of a, a technology not being against pro-life values, but mm -hmm. actually, being you know part of the solution of if we value life then we're also motivated to make those investments right, yeah. right? um so yeah no that's a huge a, a huge promise uh, in the field right now but it needs a lot more attention and a lot more investment it does okay well i i think we've we've spent a little bit longer on this issue than we intended to it's but it's a good. lot it is a lot the brain death thing is complicated and there's there's some definite room for improvement yes and, this issue more than what john oliver would say to john oliver i don't even want to say that it's like the tip of the iceberg because that implies that like most of the problems you can't see that most yeah. of the problems are not right in front of you but i think with organ donation the problems are right in front of us it's like you're ignoring the base of the mountain you're just mm -hmm. looking at the peak yeah no, no, yeah no. that that's good and a lot of the discussion about what's wrong with organ donation focuses on that those issues that he brought up man so. we're working on it Hit them with the real, the real facts now. Whenever it's like, oh, you think that's the problem? Let me tell you about everything else. Shipping, we can fix shipping. Right. It's how did we produce the product? That's yeah. where the real issues are. Exactly. Ooh. Exactly. Well, doctor, thank you for clearing some of this mess up. I feel yep. like hopefully our folks at home have a little bit better understanding of the terms. Brain death does not necessarily equal death. It's more brain injured mm -hmm. and you should be suspicious of the term brain death when you hear it. Yeah. So 
Well, thank you guys for talking about this for the, you know, 17th, 18th, whatever time. <laughs> it does feel like we have quite a few videos on this, but the issue keeps coming up and it keeps yeah. coming up in culture because everybody's like, oh, it's a, it's a good, it's, you're giving life, yep. right? Yeah, it's a good thing, right? Well. There's more, there's more to it. <laughs> ask questions. Yes, you should always ask questions. And have conversations with your friends and family. And now you can have an educated conversation and offer some points that maybe they hadn't thought of. So that's how we're going to change hearts and minds and save some lives. So friends, like, share, subscribe, and we will see you in two weeks.